Hello and welcome to Unmatched in Radiology, Exploring Next Steps, hosted by the Rad Room. We're here tonight to provide support for students who have gone unmatched, present options that students have over the next several days as they navigate the SOAP and beyond, and facilitate immediate mentorship for unmatched students with fellow matched applicants, residents, fellows, and attending radiologists. The purpose of the session is to create an informative, safe forum for students to ask questions, destigmatize going unmatched, and find mentors to assist them to navigate a challenging week. Please remember to use the Q&A feature and not chat to submit your questions so we can get to as many as we can before the time is up. If you prefer to submit a question anonymously, there is a box in the Q&A feature that allows you to do so. Today's organizers and panelists are Ashley Lau, Sahil Patel, and Arun Marugasan, co-founders of The Rad Room. Ashley, Sahil, and Arun are joined by Dr. Carol Gear, Diagnostic Radiology Program Director at Wake Forest University, and Dr. Lulu Zhang, Interventional Radiology Program Director and Diagnostic Radiology Associate Program Director at University of Cincinnati. Additionally, Connie G and Arena Quinn are here today to share their experiences the past year. We know being unmatched is stressful for students and their loved ones, and that you're faced with career-defining decisions, so we hope you find this webinar helpful. With that, the Rad Room, take it away. All right, great. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley, for the introduction. Uh, I'm going to begin sharing our slides here. Um, you guys all see, see it? Thumbs up. Beautiful. All right, great. In a second. So we want to first off welcome you to the session on matched in radiology, exploring the next steps on your journey. And begin, um, I just want to say that I'm really sorry to hear that you're unmatched. Um, I know how difficult it can be because I was in your shoes last year. And it's something that we at the Rad Room are really passionate about, um, helping provide you guys the next step on your journey um, to getting matched for the subsequent year. And so we really hope that the information uh, you take away from this webinar is beneficial for not just you, but for your family as you decide your next steps on your journey. And we're confident, I can say personally, that within radiology, there's wonderful people all willing to help. Um, and if there's anything that we at the Rad Room can do, Please, you know how to contact us. We'll share that information at the end. And we really look forward to helping serve you on your journey. We just wanted to take a moment to thank MRI Online. When we first had this idea and we approached them, they were so enthusiastic to show support to radiology applicants everywhere. They provide an amazing um, educational platform. We can learn about all things radiology, but they really also go above and beyond to support radiology trainees and people that are interested in radiology. So I really wanted to give a heartfelt thank you to Ashley, Ben, and Serena for all that they've done to put this together. Absolutely. So just a brief agenda. Um, the session that I'm going to present here is pretty brief, and it just helps you explore options, um, provides past data, which will hopefully help inform your decision making. Then really what you guys are here for is the Q&A panel. Um, we have experts, two program directors, and residents who went from being unmatched to matched who are here to give you their feedback and their lived experiences with the whole process. And then, as I mentioned earlier, in the closing, we're going to provide you follow-up information, um, access to mentorship and resources, so that as you navigate this stressful week, you're not alone. So the first thing um, we really want to talk about here is diagnosing um, the cause of being unmatched. So this image is adapted or it's directly from Dr. Brian Carmody's um, YouTube video, Match Day Mailbag, What If I Don't Match? We requested his permission and he granted it and said we can use his images from the video in this slide deck. Um, so this is where it's from if you want to see the primary uh, material for it. But the big thing um, that we want to drive home from this, this slide here is that competition was definitely a factor for everybody that went unmatched in radiology this past year. So um, when you're trying to diagnose what went, what was the reason for being unmatched, competition surely affected everybody. Then the next couple buckets that are important to think about are known weaknesses versus unknown red flags. And these are not mutually exclusive. And you may fall, maybe you were just a victim of competition. Um, and that's something that you're going to have to figure out. And so the most important thing looking at this is identifying what was your cause. And so we highly recommend finding a mentor or someone who's intimately familiar with your application and sitting down with them and trying to figure out what are the causes. So known weaknesses, examples could be a failed clerkship, uh, a repeated board exam, 
um, having to take an additional year in medical school. Um, you may have known this if you were um, going through the process with less interviews, that would be in that bucket for an example. Unknown red flags could be something that as innocuous as just something in your letter of recommendation that kept you from being ranked higher um, or uh, having a high interview count and maybe not executing completely during the interview process. Um, these are all things that are important to figure out because knowing what the cause is, is going to help dictate your next steps. So we really want to make sure that that is identified um, for you as you navigate the process. So the available options at your disposal right now in terms of next steps are either SOAP, um, delaying graduation, uh, doing a research year, or if you're partially matched, uh, reapplying to radiology. Um, so if you're partially matched, whether it's in a prelim medicine, prelim surgery, or transitional year, uh, reapplying this upcoming fall for an advanced position in radiology specifically for this session. So this graphic is just to demonstrate, also adapted from that same what if I don't match video from Dr. Brian Carmody. Um, it's just here to demonstrate that the soap is not a high value. Um, it's not a buyer's market. That's in his exact words. Um, there were 13,000 eligible applicants last year, and only 16% ended up accepting positions. And if you just look uh, under the percent of accepted positions, um, DO seniors represented about 57.5% of those accepted positions and MD seniors accounted for the about another uh, third. So if you fall into buckets that are not in those categories, it's a harder proposition in terms of trying to rely on SOAP. And we just want you to be aware of the data from last year. And then as it comes to pertinent SOAP positions for um, pursuing radiology, um, you can pursue, sorry, I apologize, the light's um, kind of dimmed here, but you can see the screen. Um, so prelim surgery accounted for the most common spots. There were transitional year spots, and then there were internal medicine prelim spots um, in terms of being some of the most frequent. Any one of these paths will get you to radiology. Um, it's just the types of the different steps you're going to have to um, take on that path. And so we're going to highlight um, what that looks like. So one of the most common things, questions that come around this time is SOAP and GME funding when you're talking about these preliminary positions. So funding for residency is provided by Medicare and there's only one initial residency period, the IRP, okay? Um, which is the maximum, minimum, it is the minimum years required for a resident to become board eligible. And it does not change even if changing specialties. For example, if you're an internal medicine resident trying to switch to radiology, you've been pre-allocated three years of funding those three years are, are represented by the three years required to complete the internal medicine residency. So if you make that switch to radiology, that would require the program to seek additional funding for the remaining two years. The same principle applies to the respective preliminary years. So what that means is a prelim medicine year, prelim medicine year resident only has two more years of GME funding unless they have matched with an advanced position at the same time while a prelim surgery resident has four more years of GME funding because a, a general surgery residency is five years. So after doing your prelim surgery, you still have four years left to go. The GME funding math does not apply to transitional years because for them, your IRP is determined by the type of residency you enter in your second year of training. This is important to be aware of because some applicants of residencies um, have, have heard from in, in the past that um, when they were not given interviews at programs they were interested in, that the reason they didn't get an interview were due to logistics behind funding. That being said, not every program will reject you because of this, and some have workarounds and additional funding, but it's just something to be aware of. Um, so again, we're gonna talk about this at some point in the Q in the Q&A session as well. Um, so options, uh, other options that are available. So delaying graduation is a common one. We have an individual on the Q&A panel today who chose this option. and. It's institution dependent. So if you're interested, asking your home program, your, your medical school, if it's possible, is certainly an option. Um, the benefits for doing it is that it allows you um, to, it prevents you from being filtered out by year of graduation um, filters that some programs may have. I do wanna stipulate that this is not very commonly found in, pro, not too common in programs, especially if your year of graduation is the same year that you're applying. So if you graduate this year, 2023, it's very unlikely that a program is going to be filtering you out um, because you just graduated. So um, this is something that 
personal experience of reaching out to programs, I don't think I ever heard anyone saying that they filter out current year graduates. So just keep that in mind um, for your decision making. Um, but what is definitely certain is that it is much easier to attain away rotations as a U.S. senior student. Um, the process of acquiring rotations is much easier when you're in school, um, because if you don't, if you're a graduate, you would acquire something called observerships in terms of getting clinical experience as a graduate. And observerships are a little bit less regulated, less structured, and sometimes you're going to be paying a lot of money out of pocket. So it's something you want to keep in mind if that's an option you choose. Okay, so if you pursue a transitional or you're already matched into a transitional or preliminary year, what is, um, you know, what are you going to be taking away from it? So if you were someone in that bucket that we showed on the first, one of the first slides we looked at about the competition, known weaknesses, unknown weaknesses, um, transitional or prelim years offer you the opportunity to demonstrate your ability to do excellent clinical work. And in addition, allow you to network with a home program or a local radiology program in your area. Um, the Some of the, the, the tougher features of doing this pathway is that you're gonna have less time for interviews and your application. Um, I know Arena is gonna talk on a little bit later today, but when you're a, a resident, an intern, you're gonna be working a lot of hours. So it might be harder to build um, an overall application. So again, finding a mentor, figuring out what are the strengths, weaknesses of your application will give you the best picture in terms of helping you decide what option to choose. Um, and additionally, so we write, wrote here, it's difficult to obtain or to attend observerships. You might not have a rotation at your intern year program in radiology. So I know anecdotally from talking to people that were in that situation, they use their weekends to go um, work in a radiology department that was local. Um, it's just something you should be aware of because it might not be as streamlined as you imagined. Um, but, you know, as we touched on, the benefits are that it can really demonstrate to programs that you're an excellent clinical uh, resident and that any doubts that may have been perceived from uh, a first year medical student class failure um, are not in question anymore because you can perform well as an intern. Um, and it allows you to get a strong. So with that, a strong letter of recommendation from a program director um, and Another option, it's not as common, not as frequent offerings, but there's something called um, physician positions, um, which would allow you to complete your intern year and then join immediately into an R1 position for the subsequent year. So what that means is there's no gap year between starting your intern year and uh, radiology residency if you were already in a TY or prelim year. So another option is a research year. And this really is, you know, not just limited to research. So we talk about if your application lacks publications, presentations, abstracts, or just general research experience. It also allows you to demonstrate um, a commitment to the specialty of radiology. There are a lot of organizations such as the ACR that accept graduates um, onto their medical student subcommittee. So I know for me personally, I was involved in the medical student subcommittee for the ACR. And in addition to doing research, able to being able to augment that experience with committed interest in the specialty, attending national conferences, it's really a great way to build your overall application if you feel that you might just be missing um, radiology extracurriculars, if you want to call it. Um, so with that, there's funded versus unpaid opportunities when you're looking at research. So with a funded opportunity, you're likely to be at one institution um, working primarily just there, um, whereas unpaid, it might be more flexible. Um, again, this is something we will touch on in the coming days um, to give you more answers and advice on this topic. But research years are generally more flexible um, than if you were doing a prelim, a prelim or transitional year. Um, and exactly. So our goal is maximize output, network, and really just allow you to demonstrate commitment to the specialty. And so the big closing thoughts, takeaways we really want to convey to you is that at the end of the day, you have to make the best decision for you. And that decision is based on factors that really only you and your mentors um, and people closest to you know. The strengths of your application, um, what one person does, what you do, it's only dependent based on what you've done and what you think you can improve on. And so we really recommend talking to as many knowledgeable people as you can to get that information so you can make the best decision. And um, in addition to that, using Twitter to find opportunities and putting yourself out there. Uh, I know last year it was not something that, you know, at first I was reticent to put a tweet out there being unmatched. But that tweet garnered a lot of attention and responses to it ended up turning into opportunities that 
brought me to this position today. So, um, you know, it's understandable if you're reluctant to, but if you want to talk offline, I'm more than willing to talk to any of you um, about that process of getting started on social media, um, Twitter, and finding these opportunities. And even if you don't want to do that, we can find you opportunities directly as well. Um, and we want to highlight the importance of finding mentors. And that's what we're going to touch on here on this uh, final slide here. So we at the Radio the Rad Room uh, created a uh, part of our website here dedicated to unmatched students. And so we have a uh, sign up form for mentors. We already have so many generous residents, fellows, attendings across the radiology community who've signed up to be mentors and they're just waiting to be paired with a mentee. So if this is something you're interested in, um, please go to the website, you can even do it now. We'll put a link in the chat and you can sign up for a mentor. Um, and in addition, there is a link for an unmatched Slack channel um, that's being organized by uh, Aisha, who's a fellow student, um, where people can have a chat with people that are in similar situations, share opportunities. I know it's something that I benefit, benefited from, so highly recommend it. Um, and with that, uh, I would like to transition to our panel. So we want to welcome Dr. Gear, Dr. Zhang, Dr. Quinn, and Connie, and really uh, thankful that you guys are willing to donate your time this evening. Great. Thank you, Arun. And so you know, before we uh, start, I just want to take a, a moment to thank the panelists again for taking time out of their busy schedules to all be here tonight. And uh, congratulations to uh, Arena and Connie for matching today after going on match last year. Uh, I know it's definitely a tough process, but you guys are proof that you know, if you really uh, commit to radiology and this is what you want to do, you can make it happen. So our first question before we get into any specifics or is really just a, a general question for all of our panelists. Uh, what overall general advice do you have for applicants on how they should approach this unexpected news they had and this week overall in general? Um, so Dr. Zhang, we'll start with you. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and thank you for the invitation. Um, the biggest um thing to for me if my advice is really find a mentor someone who I can't emphasize enough and I Arun thank you so much for you know highlighting that but it's really you have to understand what is the cause of the problem for you to be able to solve the problem and also it's also just getting into the minds of how a DR uh, PD actually or a PD actually thinks and what we do to actually look at it and use using that lens to uh, view your application um, but yeah that would be my biggest thing absolutely uh, Dr. Gear anything you'd like to add to that no I mean I would I would echo um, what Dr. Zhang said and and I think as far as at least mentors this week I think it is important to talk with um, if it's diagnostic radiology talk to the diagnostic radiology program director or associate assistant program director because I do think they're you know sort of honest you know, look with you into the lens of what's to come. I think they can give you really good advice. Of course, if it's interventional, you know, I would reach out to the uh, interventional um, program directors and talk to them or both if you've applied both, both ways. Um, but I think those people's view and the lens that we look through is going to be very important to kind of talk you through um, you know, what are the options, um, you know, and, and kind of, again, I, I think getting honest answers, I think program directors are pretty good about being honest and, and, you know, are, is there something in your application that is going to be really difficult to overcome, then we need to talk through that. How do we change that this coming year or, you know, do something to make it so that that particular thing isn't such a big issue. Um, but I think you need honest um, feedback and, and I think program directors are probably the right people to go to for that. Absolutely. Connie, your thoughts. Yes. Um, so I definitely agree with everything Dr. Zhang, Dr. Gira said. Um, when I 
when I matched last year, you know, after taking some time to think it through, I reached out to basically all the programs that I had uh, interviewed at and asked for very specific, specific feedback. It was very helpful. Um, in addition to that, I think uh, other specific things that I kind of worked on were um, looking for opportunities to practice interviewing um, and like just being more comfortable in the virtual setting because sometimes I can throw people off and um, really thinking through, take a lot of time to think through your personal statement because oftentimes it's the first thing that someone looks at. And so really thinking through how you present yourself as a reapplicant um, is something I would suggest. Absolutely. And Arena, any closing thoughts for this question? I agree with what everyone else said as well. I reached out to all the programs, the same thing as Connie. Um, I guess just something else is, you know, make sure you take care of yourself. This is going to be probably the hardest week you've ever been through. So make sure you're prioritizing yourself. You have a strong support system around you and you have people um, that are supportive and can help you through the week. Um, and yeah. Great, thank you everyone. For our next question, we're gonna kind of transition to like preparing for reapplying and what that looks like. So we'll start with a question for our PDs. And the first question is going to be, is there any difference in programs when you're reviewing reapplicants um, on whether they decided to do an intern or transitional year, delay graduation or take a research year? Um, and Dr. Gear, we'll start with you. Um, for, and again, this is kind of one program director's opinion. So this, you know, program directors may have slightly um, different opinions on this. For me, there is not, um, you know, a difference in the applicants. Um, it, it, quite frankly, I think a lot of people can't do that research year for financial reasons. Um, you know, a, a lot of sometimes paid research spots are very hard to find. Um, and I think some people really feel like, you know what, I've, I've just got to keep going. I'm just going to have to start with my intern year and go that way. Um, so I, I really personally do not weigh one more than another. Um, I think what program directors are, you know, when everyone's reapplying, what I look at is um, if you've gone you know, straight into internship. And what me personally, I'm okay with whatever. I'm a diagnostic radiology residency program director. So I'm okay with whatever internship people do. I'm fine with surgery, prelim intern, transitional. I'm, I'm good with any of it. And, and none of it is better than another for me. Um, um, but what I would say is for the folks doing that, my advice is, you know, really work hard in July and August and get a good letter from your internship program director. Because I think most programs will, directors will agree. We look for that letter. And when that letter is good, that's a really meaningful letter because you're someone who's actually doing the job. You're a doctor, you're taking care of patients, you're working hard. And if a program director you know, by September, they're going to have, they're going to work, you're going to have been there a couple of months, sends a letter that says, you know, this person is all in, they work hard, they're a team player, you know, the patients on there, I mean, they are great. And program directors, I'll tell you, they will not lie either. Um, so if, you know, I, and, and so that's why we value it. Um, and so that's, that's kind of what you're looking for, for that group. For the group that decides to do, you um, a, a research year, if you will. Um, you know, I agree a lot with what Arun was saying. Um, I, I think focus it in radiology, whatever it is, meaning, you know, get in doing some research that's in the radiology realm, but also use it to do um, other things in radiology, you know, that are not just the research. Um, you know, maybe there's some teaching things or outreach things like the rad rooms doing. I mean, you know, I'll, I'll be perfectly honest with you. I was super impressed with the rad room. Um, and when those applicants were coming through my pool, 
that was very meaningful to me. I was like, this is so cool what they did with this year. So there, you can make yourself just by getting a little more involved in the field. Um, program directors like to see that. So uh, in the folks that do a year of quote research, I would say, you know, do research, but do other things in the field. And, and there's a lot of ways to do that. And I think there's um, some folks on here can help. Uh, Arun's already brought up ACR, the rad ring. There's a whole bunch of, of ways to get involved, but I would, I would throw yourself into the field, if you will, in that year, because you'll make, you'll make mentors and you'll do, you all are smart people. You will do some really interesting things. And then, um, and then I would finish it with when, you know, when you are getting ready to reapply. Um, and it, this, I may be jumping the gun on a question, but, you know, some people ask me, well, do I just kind of put that out there or do I wait for the program director to figure out that I didn't match? My advice is to put it up front. Um, as a program director, I respect that. Um, I know it's hard to match in this. And I know this year was very, very competitive. And the signaling thing, um, you know, I, I would say that you're going to want to really look at that. I, I think some medical students probably, and we were, we, none of us had done the signaling. We didn't know what to do with it. I think we'll probably all have learned something with that. Um, but when you're putting together your letter, um, I'm sorry, your personal statement, um, uh, I think Connie talked with this and I, and I agree with Connie. I think having a program director kind of take a look at it with you again and, you know, I would be out there and say, you know, I applied. I really want to do this. This is what I want to do. You know, something in fact, you know, and I'm sure everybody's thinking this in your head. You know, I applied. I didn't match. You know, I took a step back. And, and I do think everybody should take a step back and say, OK, is this the only thing I want to do? Is this the thing? And if it is, then you put that out there in the personal statement. You say, you know, I thought about all these other things, but this is what I want to do. And, you know, but I, and kind of go from there and then talk about, you know, what, what either you've learned in internship, you know, uh, about this or what you're learning or doing, you know, this year with the time. But those are, those are some thoughts. I'll, I'll stop so that other people can have, I'm happy to answer any other things with that. I agree. That was a very um, comprehensive answer. So I do appreciate it. I think that you packed a lot of valuable information there. But Dr. Zhang, do you have additional thoughts on um, how programs view reapplicants, um, comparing the years, or just general advice of what you think applicants should do with that year or approach the year? Um, I have I 100 percent agree with Dr. Gear. Um, yes, the probably the if they if the applicant decides to go do a intern year of some type. Um, I, as in other program director that I talk to, I do not think they view it any differently, but the biggest and most important thing is to make sure you are known to your program director. Like march up there on June 24th, whatever the internship starts and introduce yourself and make sure you work hard. And probably also very good to have a faculty in their internship that knows them well, that can attest to their uh, clinical skills. Because the, the program director is probably not seeing you on a day-to-day -day basis. What they'll be commenting on is just looking at other people's like, um, comments, uh, reviews, et cetera. If you, there's one faculty that, you know, they can, that you can click with, that person will be able to say a lot more about, you know, the applicant as an individual than a program director can, but definitely get the program director um, uh, uh, letter recommendation as well. And um, from a research, research year, um, I would say do it with a little bit of caution, to be honest, because the, the amount of time people have to actually do something of value in research 
between the next cycle starting is actually really short. So um, sometimes you, you may not be able to do anything of that is substantive on your CV, especially, and this is kind of goes, goes into um, kind of back to the reason why you didn't match, especially if you're the, one of the reasons why you didn't match is you didn't get enough interviews. So something in your initial application is being filtered out. And if it was because you don't have enough leadership research, you may not get enough the second time around. Um, even if you do a whole dedicated year of research just because of the time, the how quickly the cycle moves on essentially. Uh, so I would just make sure that if you go, if you go to if you go take up a research year, they have something, you know, halfway done or they have a massive database that you can just plug and play with. Um, because if your research is chart biopsying for like 150 patients, you might not have any some substantive by the time you actually you know apply again, so. I think that that's really insightful. I don't think that people would necessarily know that going into that, so I think that's really, so nice that you have mentioned that. Yeah, thank you. That's all, that's all my comments. So while we're uh, on that topic, actually, let's hear from uh, Arena right now about what did she actually decide to do with her year? So I think the most important thing the week that I went unmatched was I started reaching out to mentors and other people who went unmatched in radiology and I just heard their stories and what they did and it kind of helped me figure out the best plan for me. I have a decent amount of research um, and the internship just seemed like a way for me to strengthen my app, kind of like what everyone else is saying. It's a way to strengthen your clinical side. You're showing your that you are, you know, a physician, that you can work with patients and you can handle the stress of being an intern, which is something unique to um, so medical school students don't have that. So it's a very unique thing to add to your application. Um, additionally, just before intern year, I had some research projects I finished up, which I was able to present during conferences, which helped my application. And I did from the beginning work really hard with my PD and did what, um, everyone else is saying and got a letter from my program director which I do think really helped that was actually another feedback I did receive from program directors was to get that letter of rec um, update your letters of rec through throughout the year um, and then Twitter was also another unique aspect of my application I got more involved got more into the community and I think you just meet people make more opportunities um, go to conferences um, and it's really hard. I did that all during an intern year, which I don't know if that's very common, but I, if you have um, an internship that you can work with, um, I found ways to make my schedule work so I could do all these things. Um, the end of the year is starting to get more <laughs> tough because my ICU is coming up, but um, I think if you're really determined and you want to make things work, you can make the schedule work um, so that you can do these extra things to strengthen your application. And I did stay in touch with mentors throughout the year, program directors, which um, I think really helped as well. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense. Connie, uh, anything to add, maybe in particular about what decision you made about what you want to do with your year and why? Yeah, for sure. Um, so... I opted to delay graduation and do kind of an informal research year. Um, so I didn't, you know, apply for any kind of paid research positions, things like that. So instead, um, I, I think the first thing I would point out is obviously think through this decision, one, because it's important, but also because people will ask you. So on almost all of my interviews, people ask, why did you make this decision? And so um, you know, I had a number of reasons, including some personal ones, I was couples matching, things like that. And so it all fed into this decision. Um, and what I did during this year was um, a lot of what's already been mentioned. I did some more rotations, got new letters, a, a few new letters, depending, and um, did a lot of research, went to conferences, talked with 
got more familiar with my program and other programs I was you know, um, very interested in. And in terms of doing research, I would say some pointers for finding research and being able to kind of see projects through, which is what Dr. Zhang was, um, I guess, like touching on as a, as a warning, uh, something to be careful about. I think I'm very lucky to be at a like a USMD institution with a radiology program that is actively doing research. So that was a definite benefit. Um, I reached out to basically everyone I knew um, who was a radiologist. And I did ask specifically for projects that were either in progress or anything where um, you know, I would be able to collect the data because now I have all this time, right? So I could just sit there for all the time in this week, this work week, and collect all the data and analyze it and write it up. Um, and it wasn't dependent on you know following up on a patient after a year or something. Um, so asking for very specific projects and they were readily available um, once I started reaching out to enough people. Um, let's see what else I was gonna say. So yeah, so reaching out with some specific requests in terms of research projects and not um, limiting. I also reached out to some programs in my like nearby geographic um, region as well. Uh, and I did have some success doing some projects with other institutions. Um, and uh, yes, and also doing things not just part of the research year, which I think was also mentioned, you know, participating in the student organization, doing like your school's radiology interest group or going to conferences and doing the ACR, things like that. There's a lot of opportunities when to spend enough, spend enough time Googling for them. Thank you, that was very insightful. So our next question is uh, for the program directors, what advice would you provide applicants on how they can evaluate, evaluate reasons why they went unmatched? We know some people in the Q&A were actually asking, is it okay for me to reach out to a program director at a program that I interviewed at and ask if there's a specific reason why I went unmatched? Um, so Dr. Zhang, we'll start with you on that question. Uh, yes, I would say it's definitely okay to reach out to the program directors because we probably won't remember you next year. Sorry, <laughs> um, but it because they're the people who's gonna evaluate you. And the second thing is, um, it might not even be a bad idea to reach out to people that you signaled and didn't get an interview on, because I think people there are two different, you know, there are two in my brain. There's two reasons why people don't go match. They either don't have enough interviews. So diagnosing why you did not get enough interviews in the first place is important. And the second is you got enough interviews, but you didn't end up matching. So that's another issue. So it could be that you're just, it could be that for some reason there's awkwardness at the um, interview. You could have had a really bad connection. Maybe your laptop was too low and everybody's staring up at your nose the entire time. So it could be really silly, stupid things um, that could, especially in the virtual setting, because we're kind of still trying to navigate that. And also just understanding why you didn't make through the screening process, because that is a big, that's a big thing that you need to figure out what changed, right? Um, and then, I'm sorry, what was the first part of the question? I lost my train of thought. Uh, it was just overall about what advice would you provide applicants and how to evaluate why they went unmatched? I would say best advice is just talk to as many program directors as you can get a hand on and like have them, especially especially program directors who like interview you, they've done, they look through your applications already and they have opinions um, already. So, yeah. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Gear, anything you'd like to add to that? Um, I. I agree with Dr. Zhang. I, I think, you know, kind of the first thing is just is is to talk to your home program director and say, okay, I, I need you to be honest with me. What why do you think I didn't go matched? Okay. And you know, because I it's it, I, I think folks have asked about so in and it it's gonna depend a little bit in in my experience over the years, and I have had applicants who had interviewed at our program who went unmatched i've had them reach out to me before and i have to admit the first 
time I was like, oh my gosh, what do I say? <laughs> you know, kind of thing. Um, uh, but I I ended up, you know, um, I think I ended up being helpful and I could look at what they had. And in my experience, okay, there there's categories of, okay, there's, there's something in the app. You have to remember, this was a really competitive year. I mean, I'm, I'm going to tell you, I've been doing this a long time since 2008. I've been running um, recruitment at Wake Forest. This was the most competitive year I've ever seen. Um, and I've seen a lot of competitive years. So it, it was, and I, I don't know, Dr. Zhang may agree with this, it was unusually competitive this year. So, um, and, and so I think that, that made it hard. Plus it was the first year of signals. And I think it is, uh, you know, I think in my experience looking back, when I look at what applicants have done, there's either the group that have some kind of very red flag um, in their application. And, you know, if professionalism laps in medical school would be a pretty big red flag. You know, um, some folks have asked about low step one scores. I, I feel like um, uh, low step scores, depending on the programs, could be a flag. And you have to think about how do I overcome these? Um, you know, if, failing a, a, a clerkship, um, things like this. Or, and so you need to kind of sit down with the program directors about the large red flags and say, okay, do you think I can overcome this? And if so, let's talk about how. That, that's one thing. Then there's the group of, Dr. Zhang sort of mentioned this, um, that you didn't get enough interviews or you got enough interviews and you didn't match. And uh, when I look at that, there's the group that I feel like ended up in, and I've seen this quite a few times, they're in the middle of everybody's list. They're really good applicant. They're, they're an excellent applicant, right? But they ended up in the middle of everybody's list. So they, they didn't match. And you look at that list and you think, oh, wow, that was a risky list. <laughs> um, you know, it's, I like, I, you know, I think to myself, boy, I hope I would match in that list kind of situation. And then when they redo it the next time, they change it up. And, and this is where I would say in the reapplication process, you need to work really closely with a program director. And my, I, you know, I think we're going to learn a lot about this signal thing. Um, I think it's going to be a big topic at AUR this year. I hope it is. Um, uh, because it's, I, I, I'll be interested to see how program directors looked at that signal. I, I think that um, programs, I think there were a lot of programs who really used that signal uh, pretty heavily um, and some that didn't as much. So I think, you know, in the reapplication process, thinking very carefully about these signals. And Dr. Zhang mentioned, you know, reaching out to the people you signaled why you didn't get an interview is, is probably very reasonable. So I, just because I was at the APDIR, so I got a little preview of the signal thing. So <laughs> I'm sure they'll have the same thing at the APDR next, uh, next month. But um, program directors are reading a lot into these signals. I'm just that's the survey data. So, uh, and then geographic preference is being read to a lot. Um, so I would say that's another thing, like unless you have very, very explicit ties to a region, like the better thing to do is just not have a geographic preference. Um, because what the surveys tell us is Program directors, if you have a geographic preference and the programs outside that person's geographic preference, the assumption that they're making is this person doesn't want to come here. That's what the survey says. Um, and then the signaling is uh, so apparently what the sur what the data is not even the survey. This is like raw data from the ERAS is 90, 10 percent of the programs got 80 percent of the signals. Yeah, <laughs> so choose your signal a little bit more wisely. 
Um, and this is a little preview. We're actually going to have an even more complicated signaling system next year. We're going to have 12 signals, and they're going to be six tier one, six tier two. And God help us when we have to figure out what the heck that means. Um, yeah, I know, Dr. Gray, you have the exact same look up I, I had on my face when they announced that. I was like, I don't know what to do with that information. <laughs> I have to say, I don't know anything about that because the APDR, we haven't had our meeting yet, so yeah. I haven't heard that. But yeah, so this came out during our APDR meeting and all of us in the room are just looked at each other. I was like, okay, I don't know what to do with that information now. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, Eras. Um, but yeah, I just, I would say definitely um, and just ask questions and be, be careful with your geographic preferences because that could burn you pretty badly. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I definitely think a, applying to the right set of programs is really, really important here. Um, you know, aside from maybe some things are difficult to overcome in an application, I think getting yourself applied to because the nice thing about radiology, I will say this, all of the programs are really good. We're really lucky there just aren't bad programs out there. I mean, it, we're a very lucky specialty. So you just need to match in any of them. Um, and there, you know, there's so many fellowship opportunities out there. There are way more fellowships than there are people. So, you know, and, and this is where I think getting advice on the signaling and what set of programs to look at and focus on that is really really important and you need to you need to use program directors i think as advisors in that process absolutely thank you both for that and thank you dr zang for the the uh, information that you learned from the apdir meeting definitely sounds like there's a, a lot of interesting things coming down the pipeline for sure um, yeah it's gonna be a wow wow year oh yeah <laughs> Well, it'd be great to actually hear from uh, Connie and Arena on how did they actually evaluate themselves uh, after going unmatched. And out of curiosity, if they had reached out to any program directors to get any feedback on their interviews or, or what might have uh, caused them to go unmatched. So Connie, we'll start with you. Yes. Um, so like I said, I did reach out to a lot of people. Um, and I think in addition to... so. So I think doing so is really great because you can ask for very specific things like, you know, is one of my letters, should, could it be improved? You know, are there any other things like really specific things for application? One other thing that I heard that hasn't been mentioned is um, some people were wondering about the specific ties I had to that program or to that region and like um, interested to hear whether or not I would be, I'm like very like dedicated to going there or very interested to, in being in this region or this location. Um, so that was one thing um, that I try to emphasize this year for the programs that I really loved. Um, the other thing, I guess I'm trying to think of specific things that were mentioned. Um, I think I had a slightly unique situation since I was couples matching. So there was also a lot of logistical stuff. So I would say for anyone who is couples matching, some quick tips I would say is I, it was, we, we got like mixed um, advice on this, but the approach we took was to be very upfront and transparent about it, about our goals and our priorities. Um, and so we told everybody we were couples matching and that our priority was to X, Y, Z, you know, be in this location and things. And um, I guess it worked out. Uh, so that is the approach we took, and I'm happy to answer any specific questions about that. Great. Thank you, Connie, for that perspective, especially with couples matching. Uh, Arena, anything else you'd like to add to that? Um, so I, you know, I did the same thing. I reached out to all the program directors I interviewed with, and a lot of them actually went through my application with me, which was really helpful in detail. They gave me feedback on my letters, my personal statement, my actual application. Um, so I think that's a really good idea to do. Um, additionally, I know some, um, there was some mention of going to your own programs or schools, radiology program director. I didn't have one. I went to a DO school. We don't have a radiology department. So I was at a disadvantage, but um, I think with Twitter and if you had interviews, you just have to 
you know, go out of your comfort zone and ask anyone or and everyone for advice and not be afraid. Um, I definitely had to go out of my comfort zone, but it makes you a stronger applicant and a stronger person in the end of the day. Um, and the location thing I think was really good, Connie. I that was a bunch of feedback I received. You know, I thought that I was emphasizing I'd want to live somewhere, but I think it's really, really important. And the signaling aspect of applications goes with that. So I think that's something to consider to emphasize location and be really, you know, transparent and clear that that's where you'd want to live and emphasize it because it might be more important than we think. Absolutely. Thank you guys for all of that perspective. So earlier we kind of mentioned that it would be great if reapplicants can speak to going unmatched in their personal statement. So I just want to ask, how can they do this well? So we'll start with Dr. Zhang. When have you seen an example of somebody that does this well? Like, does it take up their entire personal statement? Is it just a couple of sentences? What does that kind of look like when somebody addresses it effectively in their personal statement? I think you sh I, the best ones I've seen is kind of uh, approaching it like an adversity um and how you overclaim the adversity because that's kind of the big thing we always want to see and uh, the truth of the matter is is uh, this is a horrible time and getting through it and learning from it is really what you guys all successfully have done so address it head on there's no reason to hide it and um it, you can't hide it like it's going to come out like it, it it's very obvious on the application, so don't try. Um, and and just I've really I've seen it most of the time is just like address head on and say either yes I didn't match and but I still really want this specialty I'm willing to work for it and these are all the things I've done in the year um, since that time to really you know, put myself out there, pr prove myself essentially. Um, and just, yeah, like really use it as a diversity essay. And, and especially if you do a residency year, uh, a internship year, that at least from, definitely from the IR perspective, since I, I can really speak to the IR guys, it's a big deal for me. Um, someone who has proven themselves in residency just because um, from an IR perspective um, the person that's going to rank on the very bottom of my list is going to be the person that says they the reason they want to go into this is the lifestyle and I'm just like uh, you did not apply to the right specialty if you think what I do is easy I'm in scrubs right now so <laughs> um so and that's kind of like the kind of the big thing like if you do if you do a really good job during your clinical year and you you know prove to yourself that you care about the patient and work for the patient that is a huge statement and you write that in your personal statement it's like you know I took that time and you know really showed myself as a physician as a doctor and I show that I care about my patients that's that's a good, I really like to hear how welcoming the radiology community is to adversity. I think it's amazing. It really speaks volumes. Dr. Gear, do you have anything else to add about how um, applicants can showcase this, showcase this well in their personal statement? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have a lot to add to Dr. Zhang's statement. I, I completely agree with her. You, you need to just, I don't think you need to spend your whole statement on it, but I would put it out there in front. And usually what I, what I, when I'm talking through with someone about this, I'll I'll say, okay, let's let's just say what actually happened, you know, because it's happening to you all right now. And what'll happen, you know, when you're starting to rewrite a personal statement, a story unfolded in March, basically, and you're gonna think back, you're going to have reflected, you're going to have thought about different things. And then if you're reapplying in radiology, you're going to say, and I decided to reapply because blank, you know, there's going to be a, a little story to tell. I don't think you need to spend a long time on it, but I, I really respect it. It also kind of shows this person's really committed to this. Um, 
you know, and they're, they've really thought, put some thought into it. And then whichever you decide to do for whatever reason, whether you decide to go on with the internship or decide to do um, a, you know, research um, radiology sort of extracurricular year, again, for me, I'm okay with either one, um, but, you know, you, you, then you delve into that. You can say, you know, you know, recharge to, you know, uh, to do this in an internship. But, you know, you you'll be you'll have something to talk about by the time you get to, you know, sort of the end of August, you're going to have been an intern for a couple of years. You can talk about, you know, as an intern and doing this, I've really even better seen how radiology that kind of, you know, there, you're going to have something to talk about. Or if you're doing sort of a research here and you've gotten involved, you can talk about that project. You know, this is going to turn out to be a good thing. I'm going to get to spend a year kind of maybe developing some things I might take, you know, with me to residency. So you, you kind of just sort of take what was a negative and you turn it into a positive for your career. And, you know, people can, can read, can give you feedback on that. But that'd be my advice. I love that. I think this is spoken so well because Arena and Connie are two people that I am inspired by and seeing how they gracefully handled so much this last year. I think I, as a fellow applicant, was so inspired by them. Um, same with Sahil and Arun, just seeing people um, face it head on and address it head on and then say, this is what I'm doing now about it. I think I personally was so inspired. So I definitely agree with this. And then on that note, um, we'll start with Connie. Did, how did you address it in your personal statement? I think I addressed it exactly how Dr. Gear and Dr. Zhang have described. I believe I started with like an illustrative story of how I got interested in radiology. And then I said that I didn't match and some reasons why I think I didn't match. And then I had a paragraph of what I've been doing and how that has made me, you know, um, like a better applicant, more interested in radiology, more dedicated to radiology. Um, I did include a paragraph of other things I've been doing this year. So, you know, like something and, and kind of talked about how uh, like just a different aspect of myself as a person. So not just the academic radiology stuff, but some of my other interests and how that makes me a better clinician. And I think that was it. Those like four, four or five paragraphs. Love it. What about you, Arena? How did you address it in your personal statement? I was very similar to Connie. I had an illustrative story about radiology in the first paragraph. And then I explicitly said, like, I did not match. And then I went on to talk about how internship kind of solidified radiology was the right field for me. And then went on to talk about what I did. I didn't want to dwell on it too much and talk about maybe why I didn't match just to avoid negativity. Um, but it's it could be a good way to address it. Um, but that, that was my approach. And one more thing I just remembered um, was, uh, I've heard this advice before, but for some programs that I was like very interested in or had some connection or tied to, to the region or the program, I did kind of include that in my concluding, concluding paragraph, just a sentence or two about why I was specifically interested in that program. I think that's really helpful advice and hopefully um, reapplicants will feel more comfortable um, telling that story and being truthful. And I think that that, that helps because I'm sure it comes up on interviews and just prepping yourself with that story will be helpful. So it's good to know they can start on their personal statement. Fantastic. So I know we talked a little bit already about program signals and there's a lot of changes down the pipeline, um, but it would be curious to hear from program directors on uh, what you would recommend for applicants as far as what you think or how you think they should use signals next year. You know, there's a lot of talk on, you know, you should use some signals for reach programs, a few signals on programs you think you're an average applicant for, and then a few signals on safety programs. So it'd be great to hear your perspectives on how you would advise a reapplicant to use their signals. Uh, Dr. Gear, we'll start with you. For a reapplicant, I would not use a single signal on a reach program. Um, I would get, put all of my signals into programs that are gonna are kind of the right fit for what my application looks like. Um, you know, knowing, you know, upfront, I promise you all these programs are really good. 
Okay, there, there aren't bad programs out there. They're just not. Um, they're different. They have some slightly different setups. Some maybe have a little bit more research opportunities than others. But at the end of the day, if you're reapplying, you just need to get in one of these programs. I would not use a single signal on a reach. I would use all of them on programs that are very likely to interview me and that I have a very good chance of potentially matching in. No reaches, no middle either. Only use them, and this is, I, I'm saying this now that I've seen it, that is not how I advised last year. I did not know what to do with this. Now that I've seen it, um, I, that's how I'm going to advise. I don't know if Dr. Sang feels differently, but no reaches, no middle, just programs where you have a good chance of matching. That's what you, that's where you go. I 100% agree. Um, the other thing is you guys have to remember what the signals are used for. Signals are used for screening out for interviews. So if you, if they're gonna interview you just because you signaled them and you were you were not gonna be a good person, that is not a, a signal that you should waste, right? Like you you only have, well, last year six, now 12. Um, so really research your program and really just keep keep realistically assess your application and use your signal accordingly. Um, and the second thing I would say and not um, is if there's a program that you're interested in, um, you're really interested in it, don't fake it because it's obvious when you fake it. Actually write a personal letter, uh, pers personal portion in your personal statement is actually a, a like something like, at least when I review application, I take really seriously. It's like, oh, like it's not a, a, in like, don't put at your last paragraph, like, this is why University of Cincinnati is my favorite. Like, don't, that's very obvious. But if you legitimately have a reason why you want to go there, you know, write, um, put it in your personal letter. Um, it's it, it tells the program, because at the end of the day, like what programs, at least definitely for my program is, we want residents who will work hard and actually happy to be here. Um, and that's a big deal uh, for us. And on top of that, I went for um, I went uh, I went to Dartmouth as my residency, and I was also on the interview um, thing. And one of the big biggest problem we had because we were a rural program is, is this person going to survive in the wilds of New Hampshire for four years? Like, is this person actually going to stay here for four years? Because and that's something that if you have interest in you know, a more rural part of the country or a slightly, like not New York City, basically. Something worth writing about, right? Like you should address it um, because that might put your, you know, you might flow to the top from the interview process. That's great advice. Thank you. Um, so it'd be interesting to hear from Arena and Connie about how they use their signals this year. Um, so Arena, if you wouldn't mind sharing. So when I met with, um the program directors, a lot of them told me either to signal them or maybe don't signal them because they know I'm really interested. So I kind of use that to help pick my signals. So half of my signals went to program directors I was already in contact with. Then the other half were, I, I, I did not reaches, but regional programs that I didn't get interviews at last year. And just to see if maybe this would help um, me get them. So it was kind of experimental. Really interesting perspective. Thank you. And uh, Connie, uh, if you want to share how you utilized your signals this year. Yeah, um, I had a similar experience with Arena when I reached out and talked to people. Some people were very explicit, like, you don't need to signal me, which was great to hear. Um, and I, I hate to disagree with the program directors on the panel, but I would say I did signal some reach programs and I'm happy I did because I got an opportunity to interview at places. Um, so maybe, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know if I should be encouraging people to do that, but um, it was not all negative to do so. 
Um, and I, this, since we're talking about the signaling, um, I remembered I was going to comment on the geographic preference. Um, I think Dr. Zhang had recommended potentially, and maybe I was misunderstanding, potentially saying that no geographic preference. Um, I was actually advised heavily not to do that because um, apparently a lot of people approached interviewing just by looking at the geographic preference first. And so if you hadn't indicated a preference, then maybe your application hadn't been reached. And so I would say if you do have any kind of geographic preference, um, I opted to sort of state my top three rather than trying to say that like as a reapplicant, I would go anywhere, even though that's kind of true. Like I would go anywhere in the country, but rather than saying that I did opt to choose my, my top three and I guess it was okay. Well, I'm sorry, I should clarify. No, definitely if you actually have a place that you want to go, but if you legitimately have no preference, don't be forced to pick one. That's it's, it, that seems to be the what the survey say. Um, uh, that's all. That that was. I'm literally just re rehashing what the survey data told me. So I was like, okay, good to know. <laughs> that's great. Thank you all for that. And so I think you've kind of mentioned this a little bit um, that you do often re-interview applicants, but. Um, how does it, can an applicant be more likely to be re-interviewed from a prior cycle? I think we've talked about a lot of growth in that year, demonstrating that through your personal statement. Are there any other tips you can give for how an applicant can increase their likelihood of being um, re-interviewed? And we'll start with you, Dr. Zhang. Um, reaching out to the program is important, honestly. Um, and just... Um, just uh, it, and it will be interesting next month when we see what this what the survey on the um the DRSI demonstrated, but um on the IR side there was a lot of us who told our intern our internal applicants or applicants who done away rotations with us that they shouldn't use their signal with us in direct contradiction to what the ERAS says you should do. So um, that that's something to like, reach out to the program directors that you actually have connections with, like to ask if you need to signal them or not. That's something that can be helpful. Um, but um, really just really growth in your application and just addressing things head on is gonna be the biggest thing. And um, yeah. Um, just have to get through the screening process, basically. Excellent advice, Dr. Gear. Do you have anything to add? Um, no, I, I just think, you know, I, I would maybe, if, if you interviewed at places that you didn't match at, uh, you're, you're, it's possible you'll get another interview at those places, but I also might say, well, gosh, there was something about my application, at least this time, that I didn't match there, and I might want to look at another set, if you will, or focus on another set, because there's a lot of programs out there, and I might want to focus on some that maybe I didn't, um, you know, interview at for whatever reason, um, some of which maybe, you know, I didn't signal them, and boy, they seem like they might be a good fit for my application, and interest and maybe try some of that but in in the the time between now and the reapplication cycle you all are going to do some things that are going to make your applications better it may not be finished let's say you're doing research you may not have you're not you probably won't have a new publication but you can talk in your personal statement about oh i'm doing this really great project and I'm really, you know, involved or I'm, in, you know, doing this committee in ACR that I've never done, or I'm in internship and I'm getting to take care of patients and seeing it, you know, there, you're going to have more to talk about that is going to make your application stronger. Um, you know, do know that everyone's gonna, your application is going to be stronger just by virtue of having more time to make it stronger, if that makes sense. 
I think that makes a lot of sense. I think you brought up a great point too. A lot of times, at least I felt this way when I was applying this year, is that some of the programs I applied to may, maybe weren't a great fit. And throughout the interview season, I learned that as I kind of learned like what I'm looking for in a program, who's going to best support me. So maybe addressing that again with a set of fresh eyes is a great, a great um, piece of advice. For Rena and Connie, did you um, re-interview at any programs um, this year? And did those programs mention it to you or did it feel awkward or how did you go about this? We'll start with Connie. Yes, I, I did re-interview at a number of programs I did from last year. Um, I, in my experience, I re-interviewed at the majority of the same programs I interviewed with last year. Um, and it was kind of a mixed bag in re regards to how people addressed it. Um, I'm trying to think, sometimes it was a little bit awkward, but it was okay. Other times, um, some people, I, I think I mentioned how people did ask almost every time um, about the reapplication. Why did I apply again to this, to radiology, into this program, any specific interests? Um, yeah. Okay, great. And we did have a question I'll just have you answer right now. So you, you did delay graduation and you were really open about it and you advise other people to just be open about it. And I think that's kind of what we're hearing from Dr. Zhang, Dr. Gear. So really just be open about that and express yeah. it. It's kind right. of an interview, it sounds like. It, it came up for sure. And um, yeah, like I think I was saying, I make sure you like have very specific reasons why you chose to do um, whichever option you choose, um, because that does, definitely came up. Um, and then your partner also kind of had the same thing and it came up for him as well, almost every time. So okay, great to know. Okay. Address the head on, Dr. Zing. <laughs> good advice. It's ringing now in my ears. Now I know. Address the head on. That's good. And then Arena, um, what about you? And Inter re-interviewing, how did it feel? Did you did you get the same um, like mixed bag of re-interviews and new interviews, or how did it go? Yeah, I, I had a lot of re-interviews, um, and it was a little nice because you already know a lot of the the you know the PD and some of the faculty I re-interviewed re with, um, and you can they can see how you've grown over the year and. Um, I don't know, you just know each other a little bit better, but then it could be awkward because you're like, okay, we've already answered all of the same questions last year. So it's, um, but I think you just learn. And I think, you know, as, after a year of experience of interviewing, you've gotten better at interviewing too. So you're just, you're better at talking in these situations, but um, yeah, it, it definitely had the same experience. <laughs> I think that's great to hear. And really is like re-emphasizing how important it is to reach out to these programs. Cause now you're like, forming a relationship months ahead of everybody as well and having months to grow that relationship and make sure they're a good fit for you. So it definitely seems like great advice. Fantastic. Uh, so the last set of questions we have are really just targeted specifically to individual panelists based on their background. Um, so the first one we have is for Dr. Zhang. Um, so since you do have an IR background, for those who may not have matched IR this cycle, would you recommend them still trying to apply for integrate IR next year or maybe focusing on DR since there's more spots available and then trying to pursue IR through different routes such as ESIR or matching through fellowship? Um, so I always tell people to apply to DR. Um, it's just the reality of the numbers. Uh, if you look at the number of applicants to IR, versus the um, available number of spots it's just it's it's not it's miles apart so it's just not possible um so i tend to, what i tend to emphasize is going to people uh, you if you're if you truly think you want to go into ir put that out there like join sir you can join for free <laughs> The uh the medical student slash RFS section of SIR is the most insanely active session ever. Like they, I think they put out a YouTube video like once a day. It's just, it's it's craziness. I, I have no idea where they find the time. Um and and then getting involved and really like from an IR perspective the biggest thing we want to know is if uh, do you one do you really understand what it means to be an IR doc and do you are you gonna are you gonna stick it out are you gonna do it and then the second thing is apply really broadly like look at your ESIR programs and DR like 
I highly recommend applying to DR programs that also have the ESIR pathway because I am also in the process of interviewing for the independent pathway, which is the formerly fellowship pathway, which is not really the fellowship pathway, but it doesn't matter. Um, but it, it, you are at a far more advantage as a DR with the ESIR background than you are as a IR person, uh, as a DR person without ESIR. Um, just, I'm just gonna, every program director agrees that. And that is not because we're jerks and we don't want it because there is a funding limitation, right? The, as a DR person, you have four years of funding. As an IR person, you have one year of funding. If you do uh, DR without ESIR and you have to do a two year fellowship, that's an extra year of funding my, I have to find. And oh, that is not easy to do. Um, I, my hospital, like, it's just it's just not. So it, it's as a DR, as an IR person doing the, this match, it's like, I really have to think about that question. And it does make a huge difference uh, whether or not you can, you can, you will match successfully. Um, even as an ESI, even if you go through the DR and then fellowship pathway, so. That's really great advice. And like Arun mentioned in his presentation about how funding can actually play a role, you know, even with uh, fellowships and uh, as you mentioned with the different pathways, it seems like that still plays a role uh, even down the line as well. Yep. Arena, our next question is for you. And were you able to do any radiology rotations during your transitional year? Yes, I was, and that is one of the big advantages. If you're at a TY program that has a radiology program affiliated with it, um, you can kind of get in with that program, work with them throughout the year. I gave presentations, um, you work with the residents, and I, I knew the PD pretty well by the end of the year. So that's something to consider. Also, if you're going to soap into one, looking at programs that maybe have radiology programs there or nearby. Um, you may be able to do like a visiting um, away at a nearby program if they don't have one affiliated. That's great advice. And Connie, just to round it out, um, do you have any advice for people that are trying to couples match and how to navigate that? Yes, I do. I'm trying to think of my most concise advice. Um, I would say to apply very broadly and um, very much target places with a lot of programs in the area or multiple hospitals in the program, which is basic advice. Um, I think I still stand by my advice that is to be very transparent and upfront. Um, I think that it helps programs understand your true like draw or ties to this area. Um, you know, if they genuinely believe that you want to be here with your partner for a length of time. Um, the other advice that you hear pretty often, and I think it was very effective, was to reach out on behalf of your partner. Um, and basically immediately, if one of us got an interview, we reached out to the program director, to the programs um, on the other person's behalf. And I found that to be very successful, people very welcoming about it. Um, and I also even did a little bit of that during uh, interviews if the time was appropriate. Um, in my situation, my partner is also applying to DR. And so if it came up, um, someone asked, did we interview your partner? I said, no, but you know, she's a great applicant, you know, <laughs> putting it out there. And um, it is a little awkward, but it is, uh, it was not a negative thing. And in fact, it was helpful sometimes. So there's a lot of things you can do. You do have to put yourself out there though. And it can be a little bit awkward. That's great. And I think, you know, uh, interviews are awkward for everybody. So just leaning into that, taking advantage of the awkwardness and just throwing on an additional request is great. Dr. Zhang, were you gonna mention something? I was just gonna um, say, uh, uh, kind of echoing on Connie's comment from the program director side. If you're, a partner, especially if they are applying to the same hospital with a different residency, like mention that to the program directors because 
we kind of know everybody in the hospital. We can actually make a phone call <laughs> or send an email out, be like, hey, are you guys interviewing this person? We really like this person. Can you interview them, please? Um, and that actually does, it can help. Um, I definitely know, like, you know, at Cincinnati, obviously, we have the Cincinnati Children's Hospital. And that is something that does come up quite often is like uh, pediatric. And we'll be like, we'll send a message out to the pediatric program director. It's like, hey, can you guys do us a favor kind of thing? That's awesome. It's really good to hear from both perspectives, really, how this really comes together. And I like that you're 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 being a supportive spouse, you're being a supportive PD, there's all sorts of support in radiology. So it's so exciting. <laughs> And then I'll just go ahead and ask it. Does anybody have any lingering advice, any last minute um, thoughts they want to share? We, we're really uh, fortunate to have already answered all the Q&A questions, but any last thoughts um, for the audience today? And it's free to anybody to answer if you have something to say. No, oh, I do think everybody was so comprehensive. I personally learned so much during the session. Um, I do want to reiterate that we are um, so thankful for MRI Online, for Dr. Gear, Dr. Zhang, Irina, and Connie for joining us today. I think this is an invaluable session, and we're so happy you shared our night with us. Um, I also wanted to reiterate that we do have the mentor program. You can sign up for it on our website. And um, MRI Online will be sending out a recording uh, um, shortly. Uh, they're doing so much work behind the scenes to, to really keep this together. So our website here is the radiology room. If you if you want to Google, you can just put the rad room and, and you'll find it under unmatched in the future rad res section. Um, we definitely encourage you to, you know, I know it's really, really hard to put yourself out there, but um, following in the footsteps of Narina and Connie and going forth, I know some people have already done that and really inspired by those who are already on there. Um, but and just let us know how we can support you. We're really happy to support you. We're really happy to um, be with you on this journey. So anything that we can do to make your life better, please reach out to us through social media. Um, that would be great. Any last thoughts, Arun or Sahil? No, I just want to say uh, thank you again to all the panelists. And uh, I hope you guys found this beneficial. And like Ashley mentioned, if there's anything that we can do for you guys, uh, please let us know. We've got a lot of mentors who are willing to provide mentorship, provide advice to you guys. For those of you looking for research opportunities or just ways to be stronger applicants for the, the next cycle. Um, so please take advantage of that. And uh, we're happy to do whatever we can to help you on your journey. Absolutely. Take care, everybody. Thank you all. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you, MRI Online. Thank you, Dr. Gear, Dr. Zhang, Irina, Connie. Take care, everybody.